After a so-called friendly football match in Germany that involved China's under-20 team turned sour, I'll be asking if there is any place in football for political protests and what is the future for Sino-German sports fixtures. And with this year's International Day to end violence against women almost upon us, I'll be trying to find out what success, if any there, has been in trying to eradicate this global scourge. Welcome to The Point. I'm Li Chou-Yuan, sitting in for Liu Xin. Now, a football match has become the spotlight for German media after a political protest. China's under-20 football team attended its first friendly match in Germany against a fourth-tier club last Saturday. But the game was delayed after a group of spectators displayed Tibetan flags. The Chinese players refused to continue and only agreed to recommence after the spectators took down the flags. Now, further matches have been suspended. Should there be a prohibition of football pitches being turned into a political arena? And how might this incident influence future sports relationships between China and Germany? Joining me for the discussion is Mr. Xu Qingdu, a current affair commentator, and Mr. Christian Goschok, a political analyst who writes for the Stuttgarter Zeitung in Germany. And we also have Mr. Guo Xion, who was at the scene when the dispute took place. Welcome to you all. So let me uh, ask your, uh, the first question to you, Mr. Guo. You were there when this all happened. Tell us what happened, because according to the Associate Press, the Chinese team walked off the field during the first half of its game at 4th Division Club uh, last Saturday when a small group of spectators displayed Tibetan flags, and you were the one who took down the flag there. Uh, can you describe what did you see there? Mr. Guo. Oh. Hello, I'm Guo Sheng. Uh, for the past year, I have been working in Germany in Mainz. Uh, there was a friendly match between the Chinese under-20s teams and the shorter Mainz. It was close to the where I work, so I and my colleagues want to watch. We were uh, about 20 minutes into the game when it was stopped due to the appearances of Tibetan separatist flags being hung in the rings. rings at the side of the pitch. The Chinese under-20s team refused to play until all the flags had been removed. However, no action was taken by the Germans, so I decided to take it upon myself to res resolve the situation myself. I went over and asked the politely of the remote the flags so the games could continue. However, then re refused to which lead to the ins instance afterwards. So apparently things got physical and we can see the scratch mark on your face and thank you for sharing this story for us. Mr. Guo uh, works in Germany. He speaks perfect German but not so much English but we still appreciate you taking the chance talking to us about what happened there. Now Christian, to you, FIFA, the international governing body of football does have a role in place spamming uh, political slogans and political protests at football fields. So why wasn't this rule enforced in this case? So first, uh, hello to, to Beijing. It's a little pity that a good idea of sharing the, the sport uh, between China and, and the, the, these German football uh, teams has this, well, not very lucky start or maybe the ending. Um, the point is that we in Germany, we deeply believe that the freedom of the speech uh, is something which is a part of our way how we are living. And to show symbols, even if they are political, is okay as long as they are not forbidden. Um, so I know that the Tibetan flag is uh, forbidden in China, and if you are a foreigner, uh, you cannot wave this flag in uh, Tiananmen. You will be arrested. This is according to, uh, to Chinese law. Everybody has to know that. But in here, this flag is not forbidden, and you can wave it. And you should know many people do it, but normally nobody pays so much attention to them. And I'm pretty sure in case the Chinese football team would continue playing, there was no, no news.
newspaper will have any word about the flag. Uh, but only the, the, the reaction to, to stop the game made it a, a big topic. And, uh, yeah, it's a little bit of pity. And, Christian, we have a sound by we want to play. Foreign Ministry spokesperson Liu Kang said that mutual respect is the right way uh, for a host to treat as guests. We want you to hear this and have your response afterward. The Tibet-related issue involves China's core interests and the national sentiment of the Chinese people. As is known to all, Tibet has been part of China's territory since the ancient times. China firmly opposes any country, organization, or individual supporting the anti-China separatist activities of the Tibet independence forces in any form and under any pretext. I should stress from this podium that mutual respect is the right way for a host to treat its guests. Moreover, respect should indeed be mutual between any two countries. So that was the voice from the Chinese side, the foreign ministry, and also Ronnie Zimmerman, vice president of the German Football Association, responded to China that, quote, as a guest, you should be able to handle it calmly and stand above such actions. So, Christian, is that kind of attitude prevalent there? I mean, doesn't Ronnie Zimmerman have a point? Of course, you can, you can have the question if, this, if it is clever, if it is good to bring any political demonstration inside a football stadium. I think it is not. Um, and of course, the, more or less, the Tibetan flag is a, is a, political, is a political statement. Uh, but anyway, it is, it is not forbidden in here. So we have, you see, we have in, in Europe the big discussion right now is in the north of Spain, the Catalan area, if they uh, should separate or not, and you can see people waving this flag in here as well. This is allowed. Um, we have a separate uh, separatist uh, organization in the Turkey area, which is called PKK. This is forbidden, so these, this flag is not allowed to show. Um, maybe it is more clever uh, to take it a little bit more cool and with a little bit more sovereignty. The Chinese diplomats, they do it very often. So if there is, for example, an um, event in the Chinese embassy, you can see more or less always on the other side of the street some demonstrators, they want to make a kind of provocation, they show the Tibetan flag. So the, the administration scene, the, the, the diplomats, the Chinese diplomats, they know that there is no chance to do anything against. And they do the best what they can do, they do nothing. And it would be maybe a good idea also to, for the, it would have been a good idea uh, for the, the football team as well to say. Okay, Mr. Xu, let me, let me bring, you, bring you into the discussion. What do you make of what's been set there? Should China be more diplomatic about it? No, I think there's a difference, obviously. You know, for Chinese diplomats, for Chinese officials, for Chinese government, uh, uh, say head of government or you know head of the state, uh, you know, this is a political by nature. That kind of event, you can launch whatever protest. I guess you want to convey uh, a view, your point. You want to be heard by the Chinese government, by the Chinese diplomats. That's perfectly fine. But this is uh, the sports venue, and what kind of a message you are going to say to these young players? They basically know little about the politics and you want to impose the politics on them. I can understand that why they reacted that way and of course they care a, a lot about the unification of this nation. Remember 150 years ago China was invaded by the eight powers and covered up and humiliated and of course they don't like to be uh, you know lectured about freedom of speech and human rights and also they don't like to see like a foreign intervention of their internal affairs. So there's a difference. Uh, and I think we have to understand that, you know, freedom of speech, yes, there's no absolute freedom of speech, as Christian pointed out, you know, if you are, li if you are living in Germany, if you support the Nazi regime, if you say a, na a Holocaust denier, if you praise uh, Adolf Hitler, uh, you are likely to end up in detention, but you can do so probably in the U.S. and Canada, that's no problem. And, uh, you know, whether that's a problem, I think uh, it, d it depends on whether people feel offended. If people uh, feel offended, Offended, that is a problem. No, Christian, I guess but, what no, Mr. Xu said was is, the incident really brought more attention to German Football Association's policy towards China. Your reaction to this? You, you, you said it is forbidden to show the, the Nazi symbols. This is 100% right. 
even the freedom of the speech has a, something like a stop sign. Um, and you are right, it is possible to show these signs in, in the US or in England, for example, in Europe it is allowed as well. Um, but I, I told you before, yes, we have these stop signs. For example, the, the separatist organization from the Kurds, they have this stop sign as well. We do not have it for the Tibetans, but this is a political question in case that China wants to have a decision like that then. They have to try it on the, on the political way um, that, this, uh, that the, the Free Tibet uh, organization uh, will have the same, um, the, the same implements like the, the PKK. Um, and if this will be successful, then there will be stop line as well. But right now we don't have it. But Christian, isn't it a danger that we t we're turning football pitches into political debate, into media circuses in the name of preserving freedom of speech? Do you think this is what the fans want? No, it is not. And there is, a, uh, there is something uh, which is uh, the, the, the officials, now they have to suspend the games, they have to think about that. I think they will do it. Uh, you can, in, inside the stadium, there are other rules like outside on the street. And uh, you cannot stop protesters outside on the street, um, but you can, you can say we do not want to have a uh, kind of protest, political protest inside the stadium. Um, but this is something we, we call uh, the, the, the owners from the stadiums or the, the DFB, the German Football Association. Uh, they have to fix the rules if they want to have it like that. And maybe this is something they are talking about the next weeks. I don't know. Now, it's been projected that more protests, this is according to Indian Express, more protests are expected. In the meantime, the managing director of uh, Schalt Mays, Till Ploiger, told the newspaper D Belt that the DFB needs to sit down with the Chinese and find an amicable solution. If that's not possible, then it is in everybody's interest to call the whole thing off. Do you agree with this, Mr. Xu, first? Well, I think uh, there are uh, room you know, to have to find some compromise. Uh, for example, like uh, you can ask these uh, protesters to say to do whatever you like to do outside of the venue. Uh, that's for the best interests of the rest of the fans. Uh, and it, I think you know there is a separation between free, between politics and uh, sports. That's the FIFA rule. I think you know Germany, uh, as a member of FIFA, should follow that rule. And uh, secondly, you know that uh, if, as I said, if the Chinese players feel offended if they refuse to play. I think they do have the right, they do have the freedom to do so. And then there's a bigger problem. And then even, I mean, you call these things off, I don't think this is a bigger problem. I think, of course, the German side should be held accountable for breaking the contract, and then you follow uh, the law. And China can find, like Brazil, Argentina, to train their young players. That's no problem. So, Christian, let me get your take on what should happen next. I mean, is there any room for compromise? Well, I think Mr. Shih is right. So there is a possibility to make a kind of compromise. Uh, uh, the question is if it is uh, more easy to find a compromise if now all the eyes are looking uh, to the actors or if it would have been much more easier uh, to do this without all this publicity. Uh, I don't know what the, uh, what the solution will be. Um, but to, to make you a little bit more happy, maybe this is not the main topic we talk in Germany right now about because we have the big problem to find a new uh, government uh, after the election. And so the main focus definitely is to have a look at this compromise, which is necessary to meet right now. All right. So appears to be, uh, although we have different perspectives, but appears to be that we can find some kind of middle ground here. Thank you very much uh, to Mr. Guoxiong Kun, uh, Guoxiong and Mr. Xu Qingduo, a current affair commentator, and also Mr. Christian Goschok, a political writer with East Stuttgarter Zeitung in Germany. Now, football pitches are there for football players and their fans, not for politics. And the rules of international matches clearly state that political demonstrations are not allowed in such venues. So one has to ask, one why the German authorities didn't enforce such rules. If rules are not followed, then why bother to make them in the first place? Yes, sport matches are all about tribalism, supporting one's own people against the opposition, but making a political spectacle of the game is one step too far. Freedom of speech is, of course, important, 
but of more importance is mutual respect that both sides should show to one another. Let's now take a short break on the point. Stay with us. Now, November 25th has been designated by the United Nations as, and others as the International Day to End Violence Against Women. The theme for this year is Leave No One Behind and Violence Against Women and Girls. It emphasizes the importance of reaching the most marginalized, including refugees, migrants, minorities, indigenous peoples, and populations affected by conflict and natural disasters. It is said that one in three women around the world experience violence in their lifetime, often at the hands of someone they know well. So how can violence against women be stopped, and what are the challenges to ending such violence? And is the stated aim of ending it by 2030 actually attainable? I'm now joined in the studio by Julie Brossard, Country Program Manager of the organization UN Women China. And also, we're joined by Professor Li Jingzhao from Beijing's Foreign Studies University. Welcome to you both. So let's talk about this. Activists mm -hmm. have marked November 25th as the day to fight violence against women. Mm -hmm. And looking back in over three decades, what has been actually achieved? What is the biggest achievement? I think we've seen a big increase in the awareness of violence against women. I think the, the outpouring of the Me Too campaign in the West is one example of this sea change. More people are aware, uh, more people are indignant that women's rights continue to be infringed. In Professor yeah. Lee? Yeah, and uh, since the uh, recommendation of the uh, UN violence against women in 1993, we've seen a lot of improvements. For instance, a lot of countries have rectified CEDA, the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against the Women. Uh, and the CEDA has made it very clear that violence against the women is a very important issue, so they have added to that. And a lot of countries have declared zero tolerance to violence against the women. And uh, there are a lot of conferences, international joint efforts, uh, and uh, the efforts vary from country to country, from um, continents to continents. But why this day, do you think? Because it's not new that women mm -hmm. are constantly subjected to mm -hmm. domestic violence, other forms right. of violence, rape. Why particular have this day to raise awareness? What do you guys hope to achieve? Well, if you think about it, as you mentioned at the start, one in three women experience violence in their lifetimes. If one in three human beings in the world were suffering from Ebola or were HIV positive, it would be looked at as a, an epidemic, a tragedy, and the news would be reporting about it all the time. But because we're talking about violence against women, and because most victims don't step forward, mm -hmm. and because perpetrators tend to be protected, we don't understand how deep the problem is. That's why we need this day. And actually, we've designated the 25th of every month as Orange Day, uh, mm -hmm. a day to raise awareness on this issue. And you're wearing and I'm orange. I'm wearing orange, oh. yeah. <laughs> And let's be more specific here. Uh, when, you, when you say violence against women, what does this term mean? I mean, break it down for us. What does it encompass? For example, sexual harass harassment, yeah. mm -hmm. does it consider, is it considered as a form of violence? Yes. yes. Definitely. I, definitely. Yeah. yeah, sexual harassment, sexual assault and rape, trafficking in women and female children, and domestic violence, mm -hmm. or we call that intimate partner violence. Mm -hmm. All these are major components. Actually, we now we do not just use violence against women, we use gender-based mm -hmm. violence, yeah. which mm -hmm. is a more encompassing term. Actually, and in some countries, there's femicide. It's women being specifically targeted as right. victims of murder. Exactly. And help us understand the true picture here. Why the reason why we're still seeing these, you know, people uh, committing heinous acts against women after 30 years of constant movement, constant discussion, debate, raising awareness. Why is this still happening? Is it because we lack? You know, I don't think that people do not know what's right from wrong. Is it because is it a matter of not knowing what's wrong, or is it because? there's simply too little consequences. I think it's mainly because there's too little consequences. I mm -hmm. also think that in many cultures, violence is considered a part of the culture and right. people don't question it enough. And what yeah. should be done about yeah. this? Well, Stricter law yeah. enforcement, yes. would that help? Yeah. Yes. Uh, law, uh, the legislature efforts should definitely be the first part to consider, and also policy, and also implementation. 
and actually practice of law because a lot of times laws are written with just a very ambiguous and general, very, very general terms. So they need to be practiced. And also the awareness, the gender awareness of police force is very, very important. And you would agree? Yes. China, we were very happy that China enacted its first national law against domestic violence exactly. last year. Right. Last year. Uh, and that's the most important step. But now it's a question of training, training the police. Yeah. training the judiciary, training anybody who has to provide services to victims, mm -hmm. and also raising awareness among the general population. And what other challenges do you find, you know, in your work? Um, we find that th there's, there's a sort of beginning of an, an awareness in China. Mm -hmm. it, China has come a long way since 1995 when the Fourth World Women's Conference was held here, uh, when people didn't even know that something was called domestic right. violence yeah. and now we have a law and we have more awareness but there's a lot more work to be done I think the next main step should be on prevention and particularly working with children and youth mm -hmm. to help them in to help them have healthy attitudes right. toward gender and relationships and all of that yeah. Professor Lee. yeah exactly education plays a very, very significant role. Actually, constant research projects have uh, shown that children exposed to violence mm -hmm. at early age and exposed to the culture that believes that it's okay to uh, exercise violence against uh, the weaker side, if they are exposed to that and if they have lower level of education, they are more prone to violence after yeah. growing up. And we understand the date of the International Day for Elimination of Violence Against Women also marks the day of 16 days mm -hmm. of activism, at least to Human Rights Day that mm -hmm. falls on December um, 10th yes. each year. How are the two connected? Well, they got connected by coincidence. Uh, EVA Day was designated in 1999. International Human Rights Day was designated in 1948 mm -hmm. when the de Declaration of Human Rights was signed into force. And later, I think, uh, women activists realized that just one day wasn't enough and they needed more time, so they chose the period of 16 yeah. days. And let's talk about the prevalence. When you, when you look at the prevalence and severity um, of violence against women worldwide, do you see any pattern? Uh, what I find most interesting is that you don't see a pattern, that it's common everywhere. So, for example, in the United States, it's about 25% of women experience violence. In France, it's about 25%. In China, it's about 25%, despite the differences in culture. Mm. This tells me that there's something underlying culture, uh, and that's gender attitudes, and it's particularly negative attitudes toward the status and the role of women and girls. And Professor Lee, mm. do you see any hotspot regions geographically, any country or mm. any regions that we're more likely to see such cases or mm. severe cases? Well, people tend to think that uh, those countries with stronger religious beliefs will witness more severe violence against women, that but so? actually that's not the case. It, it, it can vary. Each country mm -hmm. can vary from period to period, from, from decade to decade, and there will be new forms of violence uh, popping up or becoming more prominent in different regions. So you don't think it's fair to say that much of the discrimination against women we're seeing today um, is based on religious beliefs? For instance, people always compare China to India, saying mm -hmm. that, well, there has been mass media coverage on very famous cases of rape against uh, uh, women tourists or w local women in India. But if you look at the 2016 gender difference report, actually India is placed the 87th out of 144 countries. China dropped to the 99th. So it doesn't mean that China, which is seemingly less religious, is so why is that? Is it because so it's not because the frequency of the case is really higher? It's because we are reporting about this more. Is that what you're saying? I, it's, it's I think it's a combination of yeah, things. I, I a lot suspect, of different things. I suspect the prevalence is a bit higher in India. We're mm -hmm. also seeing the media more willing to report on the cases because of what happened a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the gender gap report, there's other factors that are taken into yeah. into consideration when in the ranking. So it's a complicated situation.
Yeah. But like I said, there's no world, there's no country in the world, not even Sweden or Norway, which are pretty good for women, that has achieved gender equality. And there's no country in the world that has no violence against women yeah. and girls. For, for, for instance, uh, yeah, according to this gender gap index and also the uh, gender difference report by the uh, Economic Association, the committee, uh, gen China is placed the, the s one of the most severe case in uh, boy preference. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. China is placed among the worst countries in terms of the gender imbalance at birth. Mm. So yeah. these have nothing to do with religious belief, but it has a lot to do with cultural what beliefs and traditions. What do you think the kind of attitude toward gender um, inequality has been shifting over the years? Do you see that, that change? In terms of people's awareness uh, that domestic uh, abuse or violence against wo uh, women are wrong, morally wrong, politically wrong, socially wrong, culturally wrong. Yes, we've seen shifts, but there are a lot of uh, things, a lot of obstacles there that need to overcome. And final remarks to you, Julie. What do you hope, um, hopefully, hoping, uh, likely to see? I think, we're, I think we're going to continue to see a lot of social change in China. I, I think we've, we're seeing the beginnings now. And my, my guess is that 10 years from now, something like the Me Too campaign will catch on here. Mm. All right. Thank you very much. And that'll do it for this edition of The Point. I'm Li Xuan in Beijing, sitting in for Liu Xin. Thank you for your company tonight. Bye for now.